in recent time, you know, we see guys hitting 150, 153. They are what I call like the Formula One cars. Once you figure out they're hip dominant or knee dominant, then you would give them a different set of approaches. Hey there, Kicker Lovers. Welcome back to another episode here on the Reverse Coop channel. And today we have a very special guest for you guys. We are honored to have Philip Stefan Jones, a former professional cricketer who has made his mark um, in county cricket and professional club cricket. Stefan played for Somerset, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, and Kent County Cricket Clubs during his illustrious career. Today, he's not uh, only a former player, but also high performance, fast bowling coach. The deep passion for science driven coaching. Join us as we delve into the science of fast bowling and increasing pace with the true cricketing expert on both sides of the pitch. So, we have joining us Philip Stefan Jones. Uh, Stefan, thank you, brother, for joining us today. Welcome to the pod. How are you doing? All good, brother. Um, yeah, all good. Just caught up with some sleep from Australia. So, I'm, uh, I'm good, ready to go, ready to answer some questions you have for me. Awesome, man. I'm ready and I'm excited to talk to you about fast bowling um, and obviously the signs behind it, right? Pace is something that I've heard a quote, quote a lot, right? From a lot of cricketers over the past is that pace can't be bought in the store, right, Stefan? And which is true because yeah. sometimes you're kind of born with it. Sometimes you can, you know, obviously work on your pace. And we've seen a lot of international stars, obviously, looking to up their pace, um, you know, even a couple of clicks. So, a little bit of background of of how you guys approach, you know, a certain player when you guys eye them out. Is it you guys see, hey, does he have natural pace or do you guys separate kind of the, you know, kids with that show higher quality of pace early on or you kind of, yeah. is it always a process? Uh, yeah, there, there is always a process to it, uh, but it's important to say straight away that you're born to bowl genuine pace. Uh, so what I say to people who I talk to, and you know, some some don't like it, but I deal in honesty. I'm not here to sell a product. Is that, you know, you're born with a pace floor, and then you know your training can push the pace ceiling up, uh, and that's something that I always uh, say straight up that I can get I can get everyone to bowl faster, but I can't get everyone to bowl fast because you're born to bowl quickly. And, you know, there has been cases out there of um, some Wahabrias is a great example that keep, people keep telling me about um, that people can add a lot of pace. But what I say is they always had that ability to bowl fast. It just, it just didn't come out of them due to whatever training or circumstances or just the desire and the intent to bowl fast. So... They never, it, Wahabri has didn't magic some fast twitch fibers up or anything. He always had the ability to bowl fast. So if, you, if you're if you born with the ability, but not really using it as such, and then suddenly you put on 12 miles per hour in like six weeks, then, you know, you always had that ability. So what I do, I start with that nonsense straight away. Let's cut the BS and get on with it. And then um, there's a process. So we test everything. We test them as athletes uh, and then uh, see where we can get to really, you know, monitor the physical aspects of it, uh, the technical aspects. Uh, that's the main thing. And those underpin the tactical elements and the psychological elements of bowling. But you have to test everything. You have to know where your starting points are. Then you have to plot the journey and then let's see where, where the end game is. But everyone can bowl faster, but not everyone can bowl fast. 90 miles per hour is fast. 80 miles per hour is not fast. <laughs> so 90 is fast. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've been listening to this thing, right? Obviously, since I was a kid where pace is natural to you. You're born with it, as you mentioned, and you can up those ticks by your training and you know, your approach, as we recently saw in the Australia West Indies series, right? Uh, uh, Shamar Joseph, uh, you know, a star was yeah. born. We yeah. haven't, 
you know, young kid, 24 years old, bowling 145 to 150 clicks, you know, for 10 consistent overs before that dinner break. I don't know if you got a yeah. chance to watch that spell, but I was mesmerized yeah. by that spell, right? Um, yeah. Because of the that longevity was- of the 10 overs. So was that normal yeah. uh, for a bowler to do in his young age like that? I, I wouldn't recommend it if I'm bowling, if I'm being honest. And that is my yeah. concern. I hope he's he's looked after and I hope he has the right guidance because you can't bowl fast for long. OK, you might be able to do it now and again, but it's going to catch up with you sometimes. You know, Hussein Bolt wouldn't run a marathon and it's the yeah. same concept for fast bowling. So he always had the ability to bowl fast. I've been told about him for a long time. And uh, his, I hope he keeps that natural athleticism he has. He's not stuck under a barbell to get robotic. He has natural ability and a whip and a bounce. You know, when he runs away celebrating, they can't catch up with him. He's rapid. Yeah. So I hope they just nurture him, protect him. Bowling a 10-over spell is doesn't... And now and again, if you want to win a test, obviously, you know, but... Let's not make it a consistent thing because you'll burn the kid out. Yeah, and that was my concern, man, because, I mean, here, you know, baseball, for example, USA Sports, when a young pitcher comes up, they keep a tabs on him, right, of how many pitches he can throw and and what he can really, um, you know, do in his first couple of years to avoid any type of long-term injury. So for yeah. this kid, you know, as you said, we hope that they take care of him because I think he's he's a future star um, in the, in the yeah. cricket world. So that's awesome, there, man. There's a problem. Yeah, but, but yeah. there is a balance. I'll say that, okay? Bowlers, yeah. some bowlers are undercooked and some bowlers yeah. are overcooked. So there is a unique balance that's individual to each bowler that they need to sort of respect, really. And it's all to yeah. do with ball velocity. Um, so some bowlers might not bowl enough, other, others bowl too much. So it has to be an individualized approach. And even in baseball, they haven't got it right. They haven't got it right. So... Yeah. Um, yeah, it has to be individualized approach to every every sort of athlete. So, how do you? What advice would you give Stefan to players? To how how do we, how do they find that balance? Is it just learning more about themselves and what works for them and trial and error, or is it certain things that they can do to kind of figure out that hey, this is maybe my right balance and this is the kind of training you know that would work for me? Because one thing that would work for one person might not work for another one, right? Yeah, absolutely, and it's all about understand having a purpose in your session so you want to give the body a, an unambiguous task you want to say to the to the system today i'm working on speed so we know that speed is about maximum intent and maximum intensity there's a difference between intent and intensity okay but it's both of them we're going, we're busting a gut, and we're trying to go above what we do in a game. So it has to be 90% effort. So that's your focus today. You have to have a speed gun to do it because you need to measure the drop-off. You're allowed to drop off about 1.5 or 2% ball velocity. Then you're done. That's your, that's your training done. You've asked everything out from your body. So you go away, you recover, you regenerate, you can do other training. But then you come back the next day and then it's about sort of increasing the workload capacity, increasing what's called the prime aspect of bowling. So it's about bowling longer, but at sub-maximum. So you work at about 80% of yesterday's speed and you work for longer. You can't go flat out for a long time. That's the understanding that's fundamental to anything to do with speed. So on day one working speed, you might hit your PR in three balls. Done, finished, go away. The next day then, you then might bowl 30, 40 balls, but they're not maximum intensity. That's about then developing the workload and the resilience and the robustness. So, they need to understand that bowling for two hours or pitching for two hours nonstop is not cutting it. That is not going to help your max effort ball. Too many athletes in the world, okay, across lots of sport because, you know, volume is the all, always the one that coaches put in there. More volume, more repetition, hard work, sweat and all that nonsense, okay? 
that's not going to get you fast. So it, it's understanding what's needed, what's required to go fast is something that needs to be in, in a child early on, but also needs an understanding from a coach. You can't bowl or pitch people, for, kids for a long time. Usain Bolt and Mo Farah would never do the same training session. There we go. Yeah, wow, absolutely. So try and put take yourself out of your comfort zone, right? Essentially would be the way, like find find a way to put yourself into different uncomfortable zones where you kind of build yourself up a little bit over time and not to burn yourself out, obviously, not to burn your arm out, <laughs> more important. But it's, it's having a purpose, you know, understanding that when there's anything to do with direction, when there's anything to do with direction and the tactical element of it, it's never working on speed because fits law and the speed accuracy trade off. So if you're just pitching or bowling at someone all the time, you're not working on speed. Fundamental understanding. Absolutely. That's, that's awesome. Um, and what would be some like scientific principles, um, Stefan? I know we talked about speed and accuracy a little bit. Are, is there anything else that, you know, underlie uh, obviously principles of fast bowling from a science related perspective? And, and why is it crucial for, you know, bowlers to understand, you know, these scientific principles when it comes to, you know, working on their fast bowling game. Yeah. So there are key. So there's a difference between style, technique and mechanics. That's that's a really essential information. You know, style is different. Everyone looks different. Uh, technique is what they drill like. What can they hold their shapes really low intensity? We know of everyone who've got a great technique when it's just drilling and just doing sub maximal stuff. But what do you like when there's a force and velocity is added? That's your mechanics. So that's the understanding. And then you've got the principle of transfer of training. Is what you're doing in the gym going to help you on the field? Simple as that. Is squatting a lot going to help you bowl faster? No, it's not. So why are you doing it? So transfer of training is essential. Principle of peculiarities is another one. So by that, I mean every it, every athlete has their own uh, anthropometry and their own way of moving. Everyone is different. So individuals, you need to treat uh, bowlers as individuals. You can't put, you can't ask a fast bowler to have your uh, the correct mechanics if they fundamentally are not stable in their technique. Okay, so that is sort of the basis of all my my coaching. Speed accuracy trade-off, uh, the amount controlling the collision on the ground is, is another principle. You know, lots, the difference between tendons and muscles. Um, time is important. Understanding what aspects of your bowling or pitching needs time. What other aspects you don't have time. So that dictates your training then. Do you need more sort of speed work, tendon stuff, or do you need more muscle work, force-driven jumps? So there's eight times your body weight goes through your front leg on contact and four on your back leg. And they happen in very a small fraction of time. You know, back foot contact when the back foot lands is about 0 0.10 second. So it's that's fast. And you're landing on four times your body weight. So that it's for me, well, fast bowling, okay, is uh, uh, Olympic events. You have a sprint, you have a triple jump, and you have a javelin throw. Those are three Olympic events, but we put it all in one skill. So it's yeah. a very unique skill that requires sort of speed and aerobic oxidative base. Not conditioning. Conditioning doesn't belong in a fast bowler's program because data shows, GPS data shows that you know, fast bowling is a lactic, so speed and aerobic. Anaerobic doesn't belong in a fast bowler's program, but because it's about conditioning, right? It's about working hard and sweating. That shows you're doing well. Well, actually, fast bowling is about intensity. I manage intensity, then I manage frequency, then I add volume. Never volume first. Volume always comes last after, you know, they're, they're built up to a point where they can deliver on the expected yeah. volume, right? Yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome, man. And, you know, for, for some younger bowlers, right, that, you know, either just starting out or, or getting, you know, 
they're early into their cricketing journeys, right? And we'll see a, a lot of kids or even sometimes, you know, a teenage level, you know, actions, bowling actions, somewhat kind of being a little bit over the place and, you know, need adjustments to the arm or, or to the throwing action. It could be, one, you know, either the run up, as you said, or it could be the, the, the jump or the javelin throw. Any, any one of those pieces could require adjustments. So how do you approach that kind of a thing, Stefan, with a young kid that may need an adjustment in their action? Or, you know, you might think that, hey, this kid's probably throwing. So we got to get him adjusted in the elbow or something like that. So how do you take yeah. that kind of an approach? So first thing you do, obviously, is test them as athletes. Then you video them. And more often than not, the issue is a consequence. The issue doesn't happen at that area. So if you have a bowler who bends at the at the elbow to uh, sort of above the limit that's allowed, then more often than not, they're trying to make up for a lack of momentum, whether linear or angular, somewhere else, and alignment. So if, because the brain, you've given the brain the intention of delivering the ball, but if you can't deliver the ball because you're blocked somewhere in the kinetic chain, then you're going to find a compensatory movement elsewhere. So that is, that's what happens with, with elbow. It's never the elbow that's the issue. You know, some bowlers might have hyperextension, and that's something that you can't control. I often do some bicep curls and tricep, lots of arm work, because it also the research also shows that a higher arm mass increases the arm speed as well. So there's, I do lots of beach weights as well, lots of, uh, lots of curls, lots of bicep curls, because that is really important. But you just see how a bowler works. You just see if they hit key, key points, what I call the key descriptors. Do they run in fast enough? Are they trying to jump up, not forward? Are they getting fast off their back foot contact? Have they got a braced front foot contact? Do they actually have large trunk flexion to complete the delivery? And do they have full, complete shoulder rotation? So these are the descriptors that I would look for. Then if they haven't, then I would get the training involved to try and achieve the descriptors that I'm asking for. And that's when you train the attractors and, and that's dynamic systems theory. That's when your training then has to ensure there's a transfer of training and a transfer of technique. Absolutely. Okay. So, Stefan, I want to talk a little bit about Pace Labs as well, right? Um, Pace Labs, yeah. obviously, you know, you, you've been, you know, coaching uh, for, I think, 2009 was, was when it was founded, if I'm correct. So, since 2009, you've been in the game, even from when you were playing county cricket, you were part of some coaching setups, right? So, over the time, how has, you know, technology become an increasing part of, uh, you know, obviously at Pace Labs and, and within the coaching setup in general, um, you know, in cricket, because I'm sure that we've seen an increase of, you know, the techniques and, and the uses of technology to enhance the, the techni technical capabilities and skills, um, you know, further for the game, for the players. Um, so how has that developed in the last, like, 15 years or so? Uh, yeah, so the technology has... Um advance the skill of fast bowling but you always go back to the coach's eye so you always need to revert back to the coach's eye and that comes from experience but big thing for me is like just because you played the game at whatever level doesn't mean you're able to coach and that is coaching requires a different skill set that's why I came out of professional cricket and then went as director of sport at a, at a school and from there, then, I had the opportunity to experiment and use some awesome technologies like the 1080 sprint, um, force decks, uh, muscle contact grids, um, exergo G-strength. So everything, Kaiser machines, flywheels, exerflies. Uh, so I was able to use it with all the bowlers and collect a silly amount of data. So I know the data points. And I know the KPIs of what my fastest bowlers hit. So what did, and I always say, you know, opin everyone is entitled to an opinion, but data doesn't lie. So what technology has done, it's sort of 
maybe take away some BS from certain coaching philosophies and actually bring sort of um, facts to the table. Because, for example, I'll go back to the, the conditioning game. It, it, the the mindset that fast bowling is about doing shuttles and conditionings and crossfits and high intensity. Well, GPS units show that that energy system doesn't get taxed. Then you're on about, you know, getting strong. There's that mentality. You've got to be really strong. You've got to squat until you drop and, you know, mass specific force, which I get. And there's generic. You've got to do two times your body weight before you can do plyos. And well, actually, you know, that is not true. Research shows that that a squat doesn't necessarily mean you'll bowl faster. I've had a bowler who bowls eight, 85 kilometers, 85 miles per hour, which is about 140 plus kilometers, who couldn't squat 20 kilograms, who couldn't bench press 20 kilograms, but was rapid. So, but he was what I call hip dominant. So there's so that's that's also where te technology has come into it, is that I've been able to come up with my own pace slab classification system of hip or knee dominant bowlers. And they require a different intervention method. A knee dominant bowler has more movement, so it requires more strength. I can test that, use velocity based training to make sure they're in the right training zone. Then a hip dominant tendon driven bowler is off the ground too quickly for strength for muscle to have an impact. How do I know? Because technology allowed me to use a contact grid. I know their contact times. So a stretch shortening cycle is about 0.25 seconds. So by the time that bowler, hip dominant bowler, is running, it's gone. It's not muscle, it's tendons. So why am I training muscle? Um, so I become, then I trained more tendons and that requires specificity and isometric training. Absolutely. So the, the technology has helped us get more focused on the individual and what kind of work they would require to put in, right? So once you figure out they're hip dominant or knee dominant, then you would give them a different sets of approaches depending on where they land. Absolutely. Wow, that's awesome. And what about like, um, like sports psychology and mental conditioning, Stefan? Like... Because obviously with fast bowling, you know, and, and the workload that comes with it, um, is that a part of the science, um, you know, driven approach to fast bowling? Do they get sports psychology and a little bit of mental conditioning as well? Or, or what are some things that, um, you know, fast bowlers can do to to get those things in their game as well? Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're in the game and I've had my fair share of them and they're great. And um, you have to be open to... Um, that work, that sort of uh, direction of travel in, in a team. Um, so, but what I say to bowlers is number one, okay, if you want to bowl fast, you have to try to bowl fast. Simple, okay, the ball is not going to go down there without you trying to bowl fast. The second one is don't expect to bowl fully fit. And that is, that's a mindset then will just help them along their journey. You'll always be sore. You might have a blister, you might have DOMS delayed onset in your hamstrings, or you might be actually injured. So you need the understanding, the, the psychological maturity to understand what's injured and what is, you know what, I've got to bust the gut, yeah, I've got to push a bit for my team. So that understanding is key, and that only comes from playing. So playing experience um, will give you or will give you a lot of nous and a lot of the understanding what you can and can't do uh, psychologically and physically. So I've had sports psychology uh, and it's been great and uh, it is in the game. But for me, playing experience itself, because uh, at the end of the day, there's no coach on the field with you. You know, the best coach you'll ever have is yourself. So whatever we have, we have analysts, dietitians, psychologists, Biomechanics, biomechanists, then you know they're irrelevant on the field. You need the you need the tools to make judgments on yourself on the field. Absolutely, totally agree there, man. And you know, um, what about also injuries? Because obviously, injuries is a big part of you know it could be for a fast bowler's um, you know life. So when injuries are hit, there's obviously certain players you know obviously have to work harder to come back to that same level. 
But we also see certain bowlers are more injury prone than others, right? Specifically players that bowl faster um, or at the same clip. I'd like to give an example of uh, perhaps two guys that were the quickest bowlers, um, you know, ever in cricket, Brett Lee and Shreya Bukhtar, right? Shreya Bukhtar used to be, yeah. um, you know, way more injury prone than maybe someone like a Brett Lee, right? So what do you attribute that to? Is that because of the actions or maybe not knowing the science behind it or because they bowled both bowled, uh, both bowled at 160 clicks, right? But um, one yeah. was more, yeah. had lo more longevity and the other one obviously couldn't go on as, as long, so. But it is, so yeah, I, I agree. And there, uh, there's uh, a risk to uh, bowling quickly. However, Brett Lee was out of the game for a long time. He had to remodel his action. He was in a wheelchair for a bit because he had a bad back injury, stress fracture from his old action. So he corrected his action. So that's important. But that was early before he was famous. So I think people yeah. forget that. But both were incredible. I would add in Sean Tate there as well. He was rapid. Yeah. But there is, they, there's a, they walk. Um, so they are what I call like the Formula One cast. And they're always on the edge. They're always on the edge of performance. But if they don't w walk that fine edge, they'll just be medium paced like everyone else. So yeah. they have the ability to bowl quickly. But what they need to make sure is that technically they're sound, that, you know, technique underpins everything. You know, you can, if you, ha if you have a strong, um, so if you have a, uh, in terms of a car, let's say, if you have horsepower, high horsepower and a great body kit, then you're going to have longevity. But then that's built on the foundation of movement, robustness, strength, resilience, all work capacity. So that's why there's only ever been a handful that bowl that fast, because it is a fine balance. It's about reverse engineering and getting everything right. So there is a risk to bowling fast, but there's always there's also a risk to running fast and going in the car fast in Formula One. So speed gives you risk, speed gives you danger, but speed also gives you excitement. Yeah, big time. I and mean, we all love to see it, right? The quicker they bowl, um, you know, it's, it's crazy because in cricket, as we said, we haven't seen a lot of those guys. And, you know, in, in recent time, you know, we see guys hitting 150, 153, maybe even 154, but nothing to like getting close to that 160. So anybody in the eyes yeah. right now, Stefan, that you see on the block that you you could say, man, this is going to be the next kit that I think can, can be that next quick fastballer of the world cricket. So let me just go back. Do you know, so speed guns these days are not the same as they were before. So speed okay. is measured in cricket now differently. So I really? see bowlers now with 140 on in the clock, and trust me, they're not. Okay, they 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 are not as fast as some of those yesteryears. There was a lot back then, um, but that yeah. they so what happens now is bowlers are not bowling faster, but they're better athletes. So they are they're fitter. They're good in the field. They can bat. They can come back the next day. They can come back the next day and bowl in fourth gear, but they haven't the ability to go to fifth and sixth gear. And that's why you show it back there. Show back actor is my favorite. So I played with show and he also trained me for a session. Great mindset. Oh, wow. But he said he, he said he could bowl just as fast off five paces as his, you know, 30 meter one. But he said, People have wow. come to see me bowl of a short run-up. And also, I prefer to bowl fast, as fast as I can for five years, than bowl medium pace for 10. So that requires a unique uh, mindset, which is why he's the fastest that's ever lived. So it's really important to understand the speed guns are different these days than they yeah. were back then. But there's a boy in India who I, I'm a huge fan of. Um, and he will he's called Naman Tiwari. He's played opening the bowling you now for India in the 19s, left armor. Again, if he's managed correctly with the right training, the right support network, putting him at the heart of all decisions, not the coaches, the you know, the agents and all that nonsense, then he will have a great future. 
Wow, Naman Tewari. There you, there you go, guys. You guys heard it from Stefan, uh, up and coming bowler to check out for. Um, you know, and it's been a great conversation, guys. If you guys are just joining us, make sure to smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell icon for more updates. We're we'll just getting to the end of our conversation here with Stefan. Stefan, for you know, younger bowlers right now that are obviously training and looking to get to that next step. Number one advice for kids that are between the ages of, let's say, five and 15, looking to, you know, get to that next level. Number one thing that they could work on, um, you know, at home or or within their cricket coaching academies that they're working with currently to improve their games. OK, so can I give you three? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as many as you want. man. N number one, bowl as fast as you can and don't worry about direction. You have to. Speed is use it or lose it. If you don't use it, you will lose the ability to bowl fast. That's number one. Run in and bowl fast. Number two, to train as an athlete. Get strong. You know, as a fast bowler, you don't have to compare with an NFL linebacker or that sort of stuff. You need to be able to be an athlete first, okay? And number three, fast bowling is not about more you do, the better you get. It's not about repetition. You need the mindset that if you can achieve what you want in one delivery, why bowl 10? Okay, that is really essential. It's repetition without repetition. It's about training to bowl, but doing other different exercises like weighted ball throws, medicine ball work. You still train as a bowler, get a medicine ball, throw it, find a hill, run up it. When you're bowling in the nets, bowl as fast as you can. If you think that bowling for an hour, 90 minutes, because your dad or your coach, who's now in the 50s, 60s, say that the more you practice, the better you get, because it's muscle memory, that's nonsense. Research and modern science shows that's not the case. And I can vouch for that. I've got arm sleeves. I have a 1080 sprint that measures every single delivery. And obviously, pocket radar speed guns. So every delivery that's bold is always different. The readings internally show that it's different. The release point doesn't change, but internally, different things are happening. Fatigue, nervousness, all that sort of stuff. So if we have a bowler practicing for an hour, bowling 100 balls, for example, that's all they're doing is bowling 100 different balls. So it's not about repeating the same delivery. Honestly, I'm going to preach that until until I die. Wow, man. Some great advice for the young kids and in particular any special fast bowler that's looking to, you know, get get their, you know, pace up and work on the game and some, you know, amazing words from Stefan um, there, you know, when it comes to fast bowling advice. Um, and guys, if you guys, you know, are looking to further uh, you know, learn and, and get more insights into what you guys need to do about your, you know, personal coaching and, and how you guys can work on your fast bowling. I'll drop a link of pace labs into the description. Um, you know, uh, Stefan, I'm sure you guys have some, um, remote coaching abilities too. I'm not sure if you guys offer any type of, uh, online courses yeah. that you want to tell the viewers about. Yeah. So you go to pacelabglobal.com. There will be different options in there. There's three tiers. So you can have a basic templates that help on speed or front foot contact, six weeks program. Then down from there, you have a 24-week program, which is specific to fast bowling, not necessarily you as an individual, but will give you real massive gains because it's the program I used. And then we have a bespoke program, which is our, which our premier offering, and that is when we, uh, when I look after all the individual needs. Uh, so the programming, WhatsApp, Volt app, Ludemos app, uploads videos. So I'll be able to help physical, tactical, technical, and psychological aspects. So that is called the bespoke program. Absolutely, guys. So check out those programs by Pace Lab, guys. I mean, you know, Pace Lab is done so much work in you know bbl ipl all these different leagues and across the world making such a big difference in cricketers and youngsters across the world with fast bowling so highly highly recommend checking out pace labs um you know stefan thank you so much for your time brother it was a wonderful conversation and and really 
great insights on fast bowling, man. Pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much. And guys, again, if you're just new to the channel, make sure to smash that you know like button, subscribe to the channel, hit that bell icon for more updates. And again, Nabil Khan and Stefan Jones from the Reverse Scoop signing off. Have a great day, everybody.